um, because we had our own Secretary of State who used to do this all the time, all over the world, support the women's empowerment principles. So we want to be sure that this whole uh, thing continues uh, in, around the world. So we have a second panel here, um, and we are going to talk about the promise and challenge, the value chain, diversity, inclusion, and safety, a very important issue that has not yet come up into the conversation. Now, uh, you know, Deloitte, which uh, really has done wonderful work in this area, I think is the one that coined the term the gender dividend, which is the positive benefit of having women's empowerment and equality. And so this now, we're going to talk about how this relates a bit to the supply chain, how this relates uh, beyond those women in the top offices uh, to women all across the world, and why supplier diversity and inclusion is really important to, to the businesses represented here, but to the women themselves and to the opportunity for entrepreneurship and to move forward. So we have a, a very good uh, panel here today, and I'm, you've got all of their names, and several of them have said to me, just use my first name. So I'm not being impolite, but I certainly would like to do that, <laughs> so I will go ahead and do that. So um, Caroline Lewis, um, Project Manager of the Social Accountability International, SAI. Um, I think given the short period of time, the most useful thing that I can probably do here is sharing best practices. That's often, I think, the best takeaway from events like this, um, particularly addressing some of the issues that were raised in the panel discussion yesterday and today. Um, setting the context very briefly, uh, it was mentioned in the first panel, you know, moving away from leadership, looking at women in the supply chains. The millions of women, uh, up to 90% of the workforce in these outsourced production facilities making the clothes we're all wearing, the shoes we're wearing, um, answering the phones uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning when we ri ring our banks, uh, the telecenters, the domestic workers, the, uh, the women working in hospitals and hotels, they face multiple issues, um, low pay, low status, Unskilled works, lack of uh, promotional opportunities, harassment, discrimination, not just sex discrimination, but often ethnic discrimination if they're from indigenous marginalized groups. Occupational health and safety is just one of those many issues. Um, in terms of looking at the workplace and how policies, workplace policies provide for them, uh, not particularly well for the reasons we're all aware of that have already been raised today. Uh, the women aren't involved in the decision-making process, whether it's the health and safety committees or the health and safety councils at national level that formulate these policies. Uh, so you're left with policies that are more reflecting a male able-bodied environment um, and not the needs of those women. Sometimes if policies are in place, they are themselves discriminatory because they um, fail to understand that the biological differences between the sexes don't necessarily translate to the gender needs. So um, there may be jobs or job opportunities that women are excluded from because uh, they're deemed too weak or um, too vulnerable or for whatever reason. So first we have to look at what are the remedies available. Well, something not mentioned so much to date uh, today has been the international framework, a vast raft of legislation from the ILO, over 40 conventions on health and safety, over 40 codes of conduct for suggestions on health and safety policies, conventions we know on domestic workers, on maternity protection, but clearly change is slow, is frustratingly slow, and it requires efforts to be made perhaps from a different angle. And this is where partnerships are key. And I'd like to talk about just two projects that we've been involved in as an organization with the private sector. The first is the RAGS project, has a rather catchy acronym, uh, stands for uh, Ready-Made Accountable Garment Sector. We work with suppliers in uh, India, suppliers in the garment sector for Timberland, Gap, Primark. Um, we focus on middle managers in the factories 
because we feel that those are key to change. That was an area that was discussed yesterday and today about changing attitudes of men, if we can find that in our hearts to do so, um, because they are the link between the women workers and the senior management. We run gender awareness workshops, which involves getting these men to really think about how they're treating the women in the workplace that they work in, how they view women in their own lives at home. Um, again, looking at this biological gender confusion, so policies they might have in place, for example, excluding women from the ironing section of a factory. Well, why? It can be just as harmful to a man's sperm count as it can to a woman's health. Similarly, um, women might need to take more rest breaks during their menstrual cycle because they have to go to the bathroom. Well, those rest breaks shouldn't lead to them being um, punished for their productivity level and their, their take-home pay. So the training we've had in this has been, I have to say, transformative. We have an amazing trainer, Rishi Singh, our India project director, who has had incredible feedback, has had men reduced to tears. He's often tried to engage them by using um, or making them think about the experiences their own mothers went through. Uh, we're very proud of that first part of the project. How to implement these um, changes, because we want these men not to go back and feel forced to make changes, but to want to create change in their factories. So we're trying to um, develop management systems to implement these changes. So you have to create a team, a multi-departmental team, that will um, look at skills training for women, uh, uh, harassment issues, um, communicate with senior management. So you have awareness raising followed by implementation. The second quick project. I'm going to get you to do that with the Q and A. Okay. Sorry. Uh, but Sorry to leave gonna, it there. No, that's it. no. Thank you very much Thank because you. you gave the the whole context as well as your first program, which sounds like it's a, a, a very good one. And uh, I can just. <laughs> I can just imagine the change that could take place when people, humans, men and women, feel the difference of what it would be like to, to work in a different way. So I'm sorry to, to kind of move along, but we'll get your second point back for sure. And somebody here could really be a wonderful citizen and ask her for her second point when you get a question if I don't do that. Um, so Naveen. Um, Naveen is a senior VP and head of global talent acquisition and mobility at HCL Technologies Limited. Thank you. It's always nice to be in the diversity in this room or for that matter on the panel. Um, I come from India. Um, before I start, I think, I mean, I wanted to tell you that at least in the country that I come from, it's very important to know the, the cultural nuance um, as much as everybody else's story. It's interesting when one of you mentioned saying that we've been doing this again and again. And in India, the stories 4,000 years back when you went to the two major mythological stories were about women and trying to get them equality and trying to ensure that, uh, that they had their space in the society. And there were wars that were fought just because of that. Um, somewhere in the last three centuries, um, you also find bases, the, the invasions that happened, and in the places where invasions happened and the places that it didn't happen, uh, you find that women actually are treated very differently. So if you look at some of the Western Hemisphere in India, you would find that women contribute a lot more to the GDP. There is less violence in, in the Western Hemisphere of India, but if you go to the hinterland, um, where the definition of women is very different, uh, you would find it very, very, I mean, uh, how people interpret um, the role of women in a society. Um, I, I come from a company which uh, believes in what is called as employee first and customer second, which um, actually inverts the pyramid a little bit from what you're saying. So our CEO signs up something because it is employee driven and management embraced. And that is one of our principles. So that's probably one of the reasons why We've also been um, known for some of our practices in terms of what we do for our women. So a lot of our agenda that we do, at least we drive uh, both in the ecosystem as well as in the company, is actually crowdsourced. So out of our 90,000 employees, there is about 40, 50,000 of them who vote and say that these are some of the things that we would want to do, uh, be it for any of the social projects within or outside the company. And that's really how the agenda kind of gets fixed, and, and thanks to the social media, it's pretty easy to do some of that crowdsourcing. 
one of the things that we've recently done, and um, probably many of you would have read about some of the recent violent um, incidents in, in India against women, um, we've actually started, uh, it's very interesting, where um, at least the published statistics show that one in two of women actually get abused anywhere between six to the age of 16. Um, but the problem that is there is that half of them probably also know the person and probably don't know what to do, uh, that they're getting abused. So we've actually started a program called Chuppi Todo, which basically means break the mum, tell your mum. Right? And uh, we've actually now touched uh, roughly about 35,000 children across various parts of uh, what I call as the hinterland. And our target is to touch at least about um, a million plus people on this one. And it's still very small. I mean, uh, the, the nation is almost about a billion and a billion plus people. Uh, a few other things that I probably will leave on the table for you to mull over. Um, we've been speaking about gender equality or gender inclusion in uh, corporate world and one of the research that we did was that as much as you're chasing numbers and that's what you know, people like me the corporate animals do um, no, I, I did 35 percent of women this year or 55 percent of women recruited this year but one of the things that one of the research factors that showed us was that women to be successful in corporations actually had to use a lot of masculine traits so you no know, be it about rational abilities or or things that, that were not feminine traits, and this is not about male and female. Um, and, and our uh, training actually focused on to try and say that you may probably think in masculine traits to be successful, but try and execute it in feminine ways so that at least the diversity of why you're here in the organization is kind of retained. Um, I'll also probably leave you with a few other geo statistics that may be interesting um, as I wrap up. Um, it's a very funny country where 80% um, of, the, of the people have mobiles, but 50% of the people don't have a, a private bathroom. And that's also one of the reasons why people believe that there is a lot of violence or there's a lot of um, uh, the abuse of women because it, it's just the fundamental right in, in many ways. Um, so those are some of the things, at least perspectives from my organization or um, at least the country that I come from. Happy to take your questions when it comes. Thank you very much. I like that motto of employees first and doing crowdsourcing. That, that's, I've never heard that before, so that's very interesting. Thank you for adding that for us. Uh, Pori, Managing Director of PRIA Global. Or is it Priya? Priya. Priya. Priya Global. Thank you. Um, I come from one of the hinterlands that Naveen just spoke about. I was born in India, and I come from the northeast of India, way out there in the mountains. But uh, it's one of those hinterlands, actually, in India that was uh, originally a matriarchal society. So we really mean women out there. So <laughs> uh, just so you know. <laughs> um, I, um, um, uh, I'm, I've been working and living in, in New York in the US for um, 35 years. And um, I just left four months ago the corporate world of managing 47,000 people to 37,000 people to 15,000 people to my own company of two people right now for the last four months. So, um, and, uh, and, and my employees right here. So, um, what um, happened was an, an interesting thing is that my, I come from the construction industry. I'm an architect, a construction manager, program manager. I run jobs, manage jobs, tell people what to do. Nowadays, I tell people mostly what to do than anything else. I was uh, the chief architect of the MTA in New York City Transit when I was managing about $20 billion worth of design work post 9-11. One day, I said, I want to go to the job site and to see work. And they said, no, no, you can't go. I said, why? Because uh, you know, I, know, I, know do, I do construction. I've done construction. I know what it is. They said, no, 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 you can't go. You're the chief architect. You can't go there. And I said, how dare you, you know, da, 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 et cetera. They said, no, no, not because you're a woman, but because the chief architects, before they come, we have to prepare the site, otherwise you guys are going to write us up. <laughs> so I've always been kind of jumping at people when they say you can't do this. Um, sometimes it's not such a good thing. You have to kind of step back and, and think about it. Um, few things that in our industry we do a lot, and, and about this is technology. And people say women, you know, I've heard women have children, they stay home, da da da, etc. Well, I've had employees that had babies that got pregnant, and um, we, in two companies that I work for, we actually have virtual offices. They can stay home, they can work from home. They design, if they have meetings, we actually set them up with video conferencing. 
And there are companies who do that, and there are companies who should do that. The other um, aspect of um, technology is uh, people say women can't do construction. And I heard someone talk about, you know, what about the middle management's fine, the upper management's fine, but what about the lower level people? Well, I work with, I actually have groups that I mentor who are, where our women are in construction. They, they, they uh, operate cranes. Well, nowadays, you don't need a huge, you know, 200 pound men to operate cranes. It's a switch, right? So all of those technologies making it easier and easier for us, for, for women to get into construction. And um, so that's, that's one of the areas that, and I'm totally, sorry, totally focused on construction because that's kind of what I do in the built environment. And uh, we are working towards putting that, uh, bringing that up to the bigger companies, to the contracting companies, to the con construction community, as well as the design and the corporations that run, manage bigger programs. I worked on the London Olympics program. I worked on the Panama Canal expansion program. And, uh, you know, these, these, these things were um, sort of came naturally with the companies that I worked for because it was not because I was a woman I had to be in the team. It was because I could do what was needed to be done. Um, the women business owners supporting each other. You know this morning, and I heard that earlier, but this morning I heard an interview with Katie Couric, and most of you probably don't know who she is, but she's an anchor or some such at ABC. Um, she said something very interesting. This is Women's History Month, so you know there are a lot of interviews. And she said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't help women. And I absolutely, perfectly, absolutely believe that. And, you know, I would like to send a bunch of them there. I heard earlier that you had uh, things going on about... Um, so, um, just wrapping up on that uh, is uh, just recently I was in India, and I go back to India because I'm from India, and uh, I was talking, and I'm from the Northeast, and we said, you know, this oldest plight of women, this, that, let's do something, let's, I, I want to do something. So I decided to uh, sort of put together uh, a company to register women businesses, and I wanted to have something, you know, that that will pay back immediately. So we registered a bunch of women who own homes into B&Bs, and the idea is to basically market them as ecotourism. What I found out was very interesting, even being an Indian and having actually stayed away from what that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, I found out a woman who owns her home, who's running a B&B, actually is running into pro problems because there are other people who are saying, oh, you got, you got some foreigners coming and staying in your house? God knows what you're doing with them in there. So now we have a different problem. So we have to deal with the social, social problem. So now I'm dealing, working with the, the village heads, you know, the town heads, helping these women. So, but it's a wonderful challenge because it's open. We just opened a women securities group. So now they're guarding the women who have BNPs. It's just getting more and more businesses in the going on. So, thank you. You know, one of the things that we really want to uh, be sure that we bring up today in part of this conversation is that all of these strategies and examples and so forth can help you pull out something else that might be very useful in the work that you do. And so this has been an environment where the those huge companies went down to smaller and smaller and smaller companies and down to two people. But that doesn't really change the, the potential of being able to listen to your own drummer and to move off and do something that needs to be done. So um, thank you very much for that. Claudia Lorenzo, Social Business Director, Coca-Cola Brazil. Thank you. Let me start saying that I'm really happy to be here. There's no better word to say. I'm happy to be here representing the company, but representing the hundreds of thousands of employees that w are working hard, putting their minds and their hearts to make it happen, right? So it's a re really a, a huge pleasure to be here celebrating the women empowerment principles. This was a very important commitment because it raised our bar. It inspired us a lot and also put a lot of pressure in the seventh commitment that it's about measuring. If you don't measure, we don't evolve. So for us, it's a very important to be with you. Thank you. I will talk about our 5x20. 5x20 is our commitment, our ambitious commitment to 
empower 5 million women until 2020 through our value chain. So completely aligned with the topic today. And what we consider supporting women for us is about eliminating any kind of barrier that they can, that we can face to succeed in the marketplace. We are talking about the business skills, technical, we are talking about some assets, we are talking about integrating with the value chain, not only training, but also talking about the self-esteem component that is very important to succeed, right? And what, when you talk about value chain, we are talking about a, a broader concept that comes from fruit farmers to recyclers or artisans that work through our materials. So it's broad and we try to work with all of them in different models. Our mission is about having 5 million women, so big as our business, but for a while we achieved already, after two years, 300,000 women. That is a good number, but not enough for what we want to deliver, right? We are now in 12 countries. Brazil, that I lead, I have the honor to lead Brazil in, in Latin America to this uh, great platform. We are one of the lead countries for this uh, strategy, and why so important for Brazil? All the same reasons plus the sense of urgency. Brazil was the country of the future. Future arrived, right? So it's time to move and we decided to took that leadership for us. So we have a, a platform called in Brazil Coletivo that it's our contribution to 5 by 20. And what to do that? Different models to help women with farmers, with fruits, with recyclers, and I'll give you some examples. We have young women that have a lot of barriers to start in the marketplace. So we help them, we train them, and then we help to find a job. Then you go to recyclers. This is a very tough reality in Brazil. We are talking about people that leave from taking care of recycling and the garbages, and they don't have any business skills. So we go there and help them. Then we are talking about artisans. A lot of women, that, that they don't have design. They don't have support for open the commercialization, right? So different ways of doing, and all of them, the, 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 the girl of the time is looking to me very seriously, so I will go to the last comment. Um, in all the cases, we, we, dis we saw that you have to, to face another component that was about the social need of all of them. All of them somehow, in different realities, urban to forest, we, young women and old women, all of them facing problems in self-confidence, in citizenship, in gender equality. And these were the kind of things that we didn't know exactly how to do. So we added these soft skill components. And having said that, I will talk about three uh, very important topics that I would like you to ask me in the comments, okay? <laughs> First is about having a very important partnership model. I would like to talk about UN partnership because they have, you have, the, Rebecca is here with us, and this was be, is being a wonderful partnership because we can add what we don't have from each other. I have a very strong component of scalability, of connection with people, but we don't know that much about life skills, so we can combine each other. The second topic is about being very innovative in business models because we can su be sustainable, so we can be scalable. This is very important. This is our sh uh, social business model. And the third topic is about creating business operational models between the very small and the very big companies. I would like to explore this topic with you, so please ask me, okay? Thank you. Thank you. She's a very experienced speaker to do that, so that you guys come back and ask the, uh, the right questions. And I think we'd all like to know all of these examples that people didn't get a chance to, to talk about yet. Uh, um, all the people from Brazil, would you just stand up? We always have a wonderful group of people from Brazil because the WEPs have really taken off there. So thank you. It's great to have you here. I, I wondered why you weren't going to stand up. I saw you right there. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, this panel is really going to deal um, in, in our own conversation and with the questions that have been left on the table with some of the innovative practices. And uh, Willa Shallot, who's the president and co-founder of Maiden Nation, has a brand new organization, actually. Uh, she's the founder, and so we'd like to hear about that, Willa. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. This amazing audience. So um, it's great to be speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, Maiden Nation. Um, I've been in um, working with women for about 35 years and for the past 20 years in the arts and social change. And our most recent project is Maiden Nation. 
and the birth of Maiden Nation, the, the seeds of it actually started in the mid-90s when I produced the Vagina Monologues with Eve Ensler and co-founded V-Day and saw that women who had no money could not escape from the desperate situation of being um, victims and survivors of violence. So I went into economic empowerment for women. And then I came face to face with the supply chain, the dreaded supply chain, and worked with women around the world, connecting them to market, to very large corporations such as Macy's, Starbucks, who were really interested in having women vendors, women suppliers, and women executives, but there were obstacles. So in November, we started a new uh, website and social platform called Made in Nation. And um, to the millennials in the room, the Made Nation is made up totally of millennials and Gen X and Gen Y. I am the grandmother of this company. <laughs> it's a really young company. It's, it's an amazing um, energy and an amazing effort, and I hope you'll all consider becoming part of it. It started as a pun where we said, instead of made in Haiti, it was made in Haiti. And we wanted to have a flat platform because women all over the world who have access, who can hold a, a cell phone, can connect. And so Maiden, Maiden Nation has maidens from the, the global south, the global north, the global east, the global west. It's everywhere. And we started, when we launched, we launched very lean, and we launched only with jewelry. But now we're um, having meetings with VC people, which is very interesting. And we're going to expand to good services and um, ideas from women around the world. So I'll give you three examples, just so you can understand the energy and vitality of Maiden Nation. Um, one of our maidens is a designer named Chan Lu. She was born in Vietnam, raised in the US, and Chan makes amazing jewelry. And she does have it produced by artisans. So she's a very successful entrepreneur. She works in Hollywood with a lot of celebrities, but she employs a tremendous number of women artisans. Her, her jewelry is beautiful. This is one of her bracelets. In Vietnam, she started with a small group of artisans, and now she buys $23 million a year of jewelry from them. So when I think of the supply chain, and, and she has the highest eth ethical standards, the highest health and safety standards for her, for her workers. So both those producers and the entrepreneur are a woman. Um, another example is Gloria Steinem, who now makes jewelry, who knew. And with, we partnered with her with Maiden Nation. And she came up with a beautiful concept of a bracelet, which has the words on it, imagine we are linked, not ranked. And so we're using it to raise funds for feminist.com, but it's an example of how women's voices and women's creation can give each other energy and give each other vitality. And that the consumer who buys such a thing, even if whoever it would be, any woman or any man in the world, can have that energy. OK, I have to wrap up. I'll just say the last thing is that um, there's definitely, we're definitely on an upward trend. When we launched, since we launched Made in Nation just a few months ago, we have 40,000 Facebook fans. We're, meet, we're reaching 17 million people all over the world. So we really feel that this nation, which is about an idea, not geography, is a place where all of you, all of us, can gather, get energy, and support each other's great work, and especially the work of WEPS. I just want to, in my last second, give another hand to the WEPS team that's done an amazing job. We're really grateful for you. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Willa. How are you all doing on tweeting since we started talking about that? Have we been working at this? Yeah. You're yeah. tweeting. Hey, all right. Well, that's really good. Because, um, in fact, this is the way to reach a lot of people who can't be sitting here in the room right now. I wanted to start by raising a question or two before I call on the audience. Because one of these issues about the supply chain has always been the point, actually, we'll come back to one of your points. Um, the large company, small people, how do you begin to put together a strategy that will, in fact, um, allow the supply chain to work effectively, safely, and where it's not exploitative. Can I start? Sure. Yeah. yeah, come tell me. Okay. Thank you for the question. Now I can talk about the topic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
I think this is a topic of uh, for the small, giving technical skills, helping them the formal to formalization and these kind of things. But also for us, for big companies, is about changing our mindset, changing our processes, change some of our uh, prejudice that we have in this culture, right? And at the middle, we have to choose the right partners. Sometimes it's directly us with the smaller companies. Sometimes we can have and do need to have uh, intermediates there, and that's good. The point is how we work together, how healthy this value chain can be built, and how we can leverage that to support people. As an example, we have a wonderful case of a woman in Rio de Janeiro, in a very violent community, that decided to clean the community. She said, the public service doesn't, does, doesn't come because of the violence, I will do that. And she started to invite people to bring the garbage and exchange for food. At that moment, she, was, she suffered a lot of prejudice, people saying, you, was, you work with garbage, you are garbage. She could give up, but she didn't. She started to keep working on that. Now she has 700 families working with her, already impacted, and through our thinking, through our new business model, we are helping her to sell the garbage for the right price. So their income in increased three times, just because she has the right person to talk with. And with that, she can buy more food, and with that, she can help more families. So we're not exactly we are buying with them, but we are using the right process and the right partners to make it happen. Did I answer? Yeah, other examples? Did, did you have an example as well? I, I think it's, um, I mean, the example that is there is of um, how, let's say, technology is bought to bridge the divide. And again, it's the big and the small. So, I mean, as, as a large firm, we do have the technology. And um, in terms of trying to manage about 800 odd, um, uh, small NGOs that work against uh, or work for um, people who have been abused. We've tried to link them all into a technology platform. So at least today they have a, a self-help group amongst them itself on beat legislation, beat in terms of the cases. They talk to each other. Um, and that's been something which has is, which is, um, really helped a lot. I'm sure the technology skills that a company like yours has are in really quite short supply the further down the, the uh, chain that you go. That is true. So that's very, very helpful.